Victoria Moran grew up in Unity in Kansas City and holds a degree in religious studies from North Central College. She is an author of 13 books and has appeared on Oprah twice, and that ain't easy. <laughs> so our celebrity has, is also the host of Main Street Vegan Program on Unity uh, Online Radio and has produced a new documentary called A Prayer for Compassion, which screened here Friday and will be showing elsewhere in Dallas. If you stop by her table in the hallway, she can tell you about that. And you can even rub elbows with her this afternoon at her workshop, uh, Go Veg, Vegetarian, Go Veg with Charles and Myrtle right. at 1.30. 30. It's wrong in your program, 1.30 to 3.30. Oh. And there is a rumor going around that in 2016, Miss Victoria was voted PETA's sexiest vegan over 50. <laughs> Please join us in welcoming Victoria Moran. Hey, everybody. They told you that I come from Kansas City, and you know how we are in Kansas. We love our ruby slippers. But when we come to Dallas, we wear cowboy boots. So. It's wonderful to be here. I was here seven years ago. I was here seven years before that. So if anybody wants to set me up for 2026, I have my calendar on my phone. It's wonderful to come to Unity because I kind of, sort of, grew up in Unity. You see, I was supposed to be Roman Catholic, but my parents both worked. And these were the days before daycare, so they hired a woman to live with us and take care of me. And they didn't know how radical she was. So <laughs> she had been in Unity forever. She was grandmother age by the time I came along. She actually had met Myrtle Fillmore. That's how far back she went. And so we would go to Catholic Mass every Sunday, and we would stay, and we would get the Sunday bulletin to prove we had indeed been there. But then we would rush out and go get the express bus over to Unity Temple on the plaza in Kansas City. Has anybody been there and been to Unity Village? Very nice. And we would get to hear Dr. Ellie Meyer deliver his wonderful, powerful, positive message. And so I feel really lucky as a kid that on the one hand, I got the incense and the statues and the ritual, and on the other side, I got unity. And so whenever I speak at a unity church, I always think, ooh, this is uplifting, and this is spiritual, and this is holy, and this is cool, and it's also just a little bit rebellious. So all is well. So the reason that I wanted to call my little talk for you this morning that old time religion is kind of twofold. One is I just love old songs like that. I love hymns. I love country music. I love being able to be a contradictory person who lives in New York City and thinks that's great. And I love country music. And the other reason that I wanted to call this that old time religion is that unity has long been criticized in certain circles by not being that old time religion. So what are our roots? What's old time unity? And since I grew up kind of middle old time unity and with a woman who had been in it from much earlier on, I feel like I got a little kind of sense of that that might be something that's edifying to you here today. I certainly hope so. So remember back in grade school, and we learned vowels and consonants. So the alphabet has mostly consonants, but it's the vowels that make the words. So I have a little acronym about unity based on vowels. So let's do a repeat. Let's get a little bit of uh, reprise from grade school. Let's recite the vowels. They are A, E, I, O, U. And sometimes Y and W, but this is church, not grammar class. Okay. <laughs> so when I think about unity, old time unity and ever evolving unity, 
I am reminded of these words and these concepts. A for accepting. E for ethical. I for innovative. O for optimistic. And U for unfettered. So let's talk about each of those in turn. So when we think about accepting, I see that in kind of three ways. The first kind of acceptance that comes to mind for me is acceptance of what is. Life on life's terms. You know, so often we're thinking about what can we change, what can be different, and that's all important, and we are co-creators with God. We're supposed to be changing things and making things different and making things better. And yet, when we've got a day presented to us, and this is what's in it, we need to accept that before we can change it. So let's say we didn't have this gorgeous, beautiful day like we have right now. Let's say the rain from last week had continued. Would we have just stayed home saying, oh, it's raining. Please, God, make it stop raining so I can go to church. No, we get up and get our rain gear on and show up. We accept what is while we move into something that might be a little bit more pleasing. Now, another aspect of acceptance is to accept ourselves. And sometimes that's really tough. Have you ever said something to yourself that wasn't really nice? Like, how could I be so stupid? You wouldn't say that to anybody else. God certainly wouldn't say that to us. And yet, some of us from time to time will do that. So Unity says, you know what? Accept yourself the way you are. Because you are a perfect child of God. And sometimes you do some really imperfect things. That's all part of it. You know, we opted to come to earth instead of heaven. Why did we do that? Because only on earth can you eat watermelon in July and have it kind of roll down your chin. Only on earth can you hold hands with someone that you find absolutely divine and take a nice walk with them through the woods or along the beach. So we're here. And because of this, we get to deal with planes of opposites. So we get to deal with things that are unpleasant and pleasant. We get to deal with people that we're crazy about and people who are annoying and sometimes they're the same person. <laughs> and so we accept. Then, when we think about our falling short, we can get hung up on that. Even somebody who is revered as holy, like St. Francis. And I kind of think of Charles Fillmore as being the St. Francis of Protestantism in his generation, the way St. Francis was who he was to Catholicism when he lived. Now, St. Francis was a little bit of a radical because he was living with his, his monks out in this area that wasn't very developed, and they were just basically living on bread and worshiping God. And the church was not real fond of that. They weren't doing the pomp and circumstance, and he was getting in a little bit of hot water, and he said, well, I think I'm doing God's will, but if I'm not, I really want to find out so that I can change. So I'm going to go on a, a journey, an odyssey, to the Vatican. And I am going to meet with the Pope and find out if I'm on the right track or not. So, at least in the movie version, beautiful movie, 1969, Franco Zeffirelli, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. Has anybody seen that? Oh, it's a beautiful old movie. My cat used to love it whenever I'd play that movie because there were lots of birds flying around. So, St. Francis goes to the Vatican and pleads his case to the Pope who is so taken with this man's piety, with his sincerity, with the love that he was expressing for all life, that the Pope said to him, we have gotten so concerned about original sin, I fear we have forgotten original innocence. And in self-acceptance, we can remember our own original innocence. We are, after all, in the image and likeness of God. And we have the opportunity every day to express as much of that as we possibly can. Now, who else do we need to accept? Oh, those other people. Ah, 
that's sometimes a little bit tricky too. And what was revolutionary about unity in its time was acceptance of all spiritual paths. I can remember Dee Dee, this wonderful woman who presented unity to me, who helped my parents raise me. And she would say, all the religions are just getting you back to God. Because the word religion in Latin comes from religare, to lead back. And so unity would say, the more the merrier. Welcome everybody. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore in 1893 attended the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago. It was part of the World's Fair. And this was such an interesting time to bring together people from all over the world. And one of the gentlemen who was at that event was Swami Vivekananda, who had come from India. He was the first Indian yogi to come to North America. Now, this was a very different time. Swami, Such, Swami Vivekananda had a terrible time finding accommodations in Chicago because this was the era of segregation and great prejudice. And what did the Fillmores do? They invited him to Kansas City. And in fact, he was the one who advised them on the height of the Unity Tower because in the Indian tradition, there's a particular elevation that is considered to be ideal for meditation. So we had this cross-pollination even back then. And you know, sometimes people have criticized unity and they say, ooh, well that seems very new age. Well, it's not new age. New age happened in the 1970s. Unity happened in the 1890s. But it did come out of this interesting period of religious expansion in America. So we had the whole new thought movement, which is the idea that our thoughts really do create our circumstances. So there was Dr. Phineas P. Quimby, who influenced Mary Baker Eddy, and she brought Christian science to the world. And in the old days, sometimes people didn't know what unity was, but they kind of knew what Christian science was. And so Dee Dee would say to them, well, Unity is a lot like Christian science, but in unity, you can go to a doctor if your faith is not strong enough to heal yourself. So we've always had a little bit of that elastic waist thing going on. And so at that time in history, that late 1800s, early 1900s, so much was happening. So much was growing. So unity was happening in, in Kansas City on the Missouri side in 1893. And in 1901, a little further west in Topeka, Kansas, the Pentecostal movement happened. There were revivals. There was all sorts of religious growth and excitement. But also what was happening at this time was that science was becoming a thing. And science was beginning to explain things that were not understood before. And this was very confusing to a lot of people. And a lot of people thought, well, then I've got to throw out religion. I mean, if science is suggesting that Jonah probably didn't live all that time in the body of a big fish, I just need to throw out all of it. Atheism started coming into the picture for the first time really in history. And yet there were these other teachers, these other thinkers who were saying, you know what? All that we're learning from science, God created it. So God doesn't have a problem with science. Why should we? And they figured out ways to marry science and scripture, what we know from the intelligence in this world and what we know from that deep truth of God within. So here we are in unity, A for acceptance. Now the next vowel is E, which stands for ethical. And sometimes in unity, we don't do a lot of thinking about ethics and morality. I think we just accept, you know, we're good people. We come to church, of course we're ethical. And yet the Fillmores were deeply ethical and they thought about their ethics not just in terms of is this good is this bad does this harm somebody does it not but they thought about the ripple effect because they understood that our thoughts are creative our words are creative and our actions change the world the beautiful mystical poem by francis thompson thou canst not disturb a flower without troubling a star. 
was very much Fillmoreian. And so in the original statement of faith for unity, did you all know that we used to have 32 principles of faith? And they were laid out, and each one of them started with, we believe, the closest thing unity ever had to a creed. And so in 1939, they took two of them out because the world was becoming more sophisticated, more troubled in a lot of ways. We'd just been through World War II, going through World War II. And so they took out one principle that had to do with food. Now, the Fillmores were vegetarian. And as your former minister, Reverend Ev El Ugh, Ellen Devonfort, says in the film that I've produced, A Prayer for Compassion, she says, I knew from ministerial school that the Fillmores were vegetarian, but I didn't know until much later they were ferociously vegetarian. I'd never quite heard that term, but they were very deeply committed to this, and it was in that statement of faith, and what is very interesting to a historian of unity is the way they worded it. They said, we believe that it is wrong to kill animals for food or be a party to that. Woo! Wrong. We don't use that word a lot in unity, but Charles Fillmore used it, and he said, we believe that as long as people are killing animals for food, there's going to be cruelty and war among humans. Woo! Does that mean we're all supposed to rush out and change our diet? I don't know, but we're in unity. So it's something to look at. It's something to think about. And that, in fact, is what the workshop this afternoon is going to be about. I hope you'll all come. We're going to have some really great food, too. But the other um, precept that was taken out of that statement of faith had to do with sex. Now, it didn't say you have to be prudish. Come on, I'm Peter's sexiest vegan over 50, 2016. It didn't say who you had to love, how you had to love. It didn't say you stay in an abusive relationship. But what it did say was, we believe that the generative powers can cause a great deal of suffering to people. So you need to be careful. Well, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, 50 years after that precept was removed, I kind of wish it had stayed in. Because I was in my 30s, and I was widowed, and I didn't know what was up. You know, you have a traumatic experience in your life, and you're just off-center and off-kilter. And all I knew was, I used to have this life with a husband and a child and me, and it was all right. And then, tragically, one of the pieces was all of a sudden missing. And all I could think about was fill that hole. Fill that space. So I'm sure it was really fun to date me back in those days because it would have been, hey, you, you're good looking. You want to fill the space? It's missing. It's empty. You could go there. And so when I heard that they were doing a workshop for singles at my Unity Church in Kansas City, it was just like, woo-hoo, I am going to get some affirmations. I am going to get some information. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to get myself a man. Woo-hoo, that is my class. So went to the class, taught by Reverend Jim Rosemurgy. Some of you know him. And I'm looking around thinking, hmm, who can I meet? And after we all introduced ourselves, Reverend Jim said, uh, I have a proposition for all you newly single people. And that proposition is, I want you to commit to not dating for one year. No, 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 no. I left. I literally left. I left before the love offering because I felt so empty. I had to be validated. I needed somebody else to convince me that I was important, that I was attractive, that I was wanted, that I was necessary, that I still had a role to play in this world. Now, unity has always been wonderful about respecting both ways that we have to learn things on earth. So one way we can learn things is to accept the advice, the knowledge, the wisdom that is available to us. And we can get that knowledge and wisdom all kinds of ways. We can get it direct God, direct revelation, 
inspiration. Emily Cady said, when we pray, we are talking to God. When we meditate, we get inspiration from God. We get inspiration from the Bible. We get inspiration from wonderful wisdom and books and people who have been there in Super Soul Sunday. It is fabulous. It's coming in from all over. But sometimes we don't take it. You know, we kind of hear it and it goes, Phew! and we have to go out and learn from experience. And that's what I did. So I left before the love offering and I went back out into my world and my world was find this replacement person in your life. And so I would say for about eight years, I got to learn that way from a lot of suffering, not nonstop unrelenting suffering, but just a lot of disappointments, a lot of false starts, a lot of kissing frogs. And ultimately, I came to know myself through all that, probably the way I would have come to know myself in one year had I done what Jim Rosemurgy said to do. But it's cool. This is the acceptance and wonderfulness of unity. You learn however you need to learn, but do your best to live an ethical life as that comes through to you today. A, acceptance. E, ethical. I, innovative. I don't think I understood how innovative the Fillmores were, how innovative the early unity movement was until this past September when I went to Kansas City, and I have to tell you why I did that because I'm a mom and I'm proud. My daughter is a superhero. She is on tour right now with Marvel Universe Live in the role of Rocket Raccoon. Who knows enough about Marvel to know? Rocket Raccoon, she wears a 20-pound costume with a 5-pound jetpack. So anyway, I went there to see her perform. And something just told me on Saturday evening, if you drive by the original Unity headquarters at 9th and Tracy, somebody will be there and you'll have a really great experience. Do you ever get those kind of God things and it's like, huh? What? I'm supposed to drive over there? But it was a really strong urge. Now, when I grew up in Unity, that location was already gone. It had become the bus driver's union hall. So I never went there. But at some point in later history, I believe it was the late 1980s, a Unity minister purchased that property, and it's once again operative in a part of town where, you know, you kind of get to urban blight and, and things are torn down and all around it is just kind of empty fields. And here is this wonderful building that has been there since 1893, built for unity. So I went over there, and even though it was Saturday night, and who's in a church on a Saturday night? The minister was there, the custodian was there, and they started showing me stuff. It was so cool. I was in the original room of Silent Unity. Now, those of you who are visitors and might not know, Silent Unity is this church's prayer ministry that has been going on for over 120 years, well over. And it started with one guy in one room, in one chair, with one phone. And he would pray. And the phone would ring, and he'd pray with the person. He'd hang up, and he'd pray some more. And eventually, it became so popular that it was manned all through the day, 24 hours as it is now. And to be in that room was magnificent. But another thing that was just so cool was to get to see the 1923 silent movie that Charles Fillmore commissioned a Hollywood crew to go out to Kansas City and film about what was going on at Unity. But it wasn't about beliefs and theology and that kind of thing. It was about Unity's innovation. They were totally technically on top of what was the way of things at that time. So they were very proud to show in this film that they had an electric letter opener because they were getting so many requests for publications because, you know, Unity didn't start as a church. It started as a publishing house. Unity School of Christianity. This is an educational ministry that will help you in whatever church you're in 
to be better at being whatever you are. So they were getting those requests, they were getting prayer requests for silent unity, and so they had this automatic letter opener, and they had an automatic printer, so you didn't have to have the fountain pen and dip it in the ink and write all those letters to people. And they even, in 1921, started doing radio. And what that took at that time was to build a great big radio tower on top of that Unity building. Well, radio has always been a little funny. You just never quite know how far that wattage is going to go. And so as a teenager, I can remember going outside and sitting in the car so that I could pick up WLS from Chicago because they got the Beatles and the Rolling Stones song quicker than the Kansas City stations. Well, what happened with Unity and their radio was mostly it went to the Midwest, but sometimes it went really far, and sometimes it crossed continents and oceans, and it went to Nigeria. And the very first Unity ministry outside Kansas City was in Nigeria because people there had heard that ministry. So I have to admit, I am a Luddite. Sometimes I wish that I had just been born and died before the internet era. I think I live my life really well without having to keep 187 passwords memorized. And yet, the Fillmores, if they were here today, oh my gosh, they would be more innovative than Steve Jobs. They were up on top of everything. Why? Because this is a life-saving, healing, uplifting message, and we need to get it out there. So I am really grateful today to be part of Unity Online Radio, because that's continuing in that tradition. Only now, it's 24 hours a day, all around the world, wherever you want it. So Unity is innovative, and we can be innovative too. And O is for optimistic. Unity has always been known as a positive faith, and it hasn't always been congratulated for that. I can remember as a young woman when I would tell people there in Kansas City that I was in Unity, and they would say, Unity, that's a happy religion. And the subtext was, you may as well be happy now, because hell is hot and it lasts a long time. <laughs> but why shouldn't we be happy? Why shouldn't we have hope for the future? Because who made us? God. God is good. God is not just loving. God is love. And what can you make out of love except some really good stuff? And people will say, yes, but if there's all this optimism going on, why do I have all these issues in my life? Well, you know how they say it always works out in the end? If it hasn't worked out, maybe it's not the end. So unity is optimistic. Why not? Because what else can we be? What are we going to create with our powerful ability to think other than to create more good? For all concerned. So yeah, unity is optimistic. And I can tell you that that unity optimism at the bleakest time of my life changed everything. I told you that my husband died, my first husband. He didn't just die. He committed suicide. He'd had anxiety and depression his whole life. And one day it got to be too much. And I was slammed. Grief, guilt, why couldn't I see this? Why didn't I do something? And I had a little girl, and I had pretty much no money to speak of, and it was as if life was happening around me, and I was just in the midst of it. So I spent a lot of time sitting in a rocking chair, noticing that various relatives were coming in and bringing pies, and just thinking, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm in this because I have this little girl, but 
my life is pretty much over. And as I was just in the depths of grief and depression and the inability to come up with any kind of positive thought, you know how God sometimes does it? You shut him out. You say, no, I don't want any of this power and glory. Just let me be in my depths. But sometimes that spirit of God finds a little hole in your negativity, a little crawl space down there in the basement of your psyche, and he can come in. And that day he came in for me, and he reminded me of a newspaper ad that I had seen months before, and it said that airlines sell these tickets, and you can go around the world. And you keep going in one direction, and they let you have one back check. And you can go and you can see that not everybody thinks like we think and not everybody lives the way we live. And I thought, what an amazing gift to give to my little girl before she has to go to school. It started to look like a really good idea. It started to look like one of those divine ideas that they talk about in unity. Well, it happened that my mother had come to help out during this terrible times she was in the kitchen cooking and so I was getting excited and I went in there and I said mom mom I have this idea you know I saw this ad and a lot of the airlines do this you can buy this round the world ticket as long as you keep going in one direction and for a child it's half price and you can take one backtrack and you can keep on going and she could see that not everybody lives the way we live not everybody thinks the way we think. What a wonderful gift would this be to that little girl before she has to start school. And my mom took off her apron. Because there are some things you simply cannot say while wearing an apron. And she said... You are all alone in the world with a little girl. Hasn't even this taken the wind out of your sails? Ugh. I said, oh yeah, you're right. It's a grief. I'm losing it. I'm sorry. God. And I'm back to the rocking chair. But I had a lot of unity in me by that time. And welling up in my soul was, you know what? If the wind came out of your sails, that little girl over there in Unity's Montessori Preschool may as well have two dead parents because the one she's got wouldn't be worth much. So we went around the world. And two years later, we went again, and we went to remarkable places. We went to Nepal. We went to Tibet. At one point, before we left for the second trip, we were invited to St. Louis, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama was going to be speaking. I got to go to the press conference, and he met my little girl, and she is eight years old then, and he gave her a kata, which is this long satin scarf with fringes on the end. And in Tibet, when they want to show respect and give you a blessing, they put this kata over your neck. He did that for her. And five, six years later, when our wonderful cat Benjamin was about to make his transition, my daughter went to the wall where she had hung her Dalai Lama kata, and she took it down and she wrapped Benjamin in all those blessings. Because just like you've got these little stuffed animals in your hands today, we take the blessings, we infuse it into the material world, and we send those blessings out. What goes around comes around and around and out, and it ripples, and so it is. Optimism, you, final vowel, unfettered. Now, Lots of times in Unity, we talk about being unlimited. That's a cool concept, but I don't think it quite works in the material world. So, for example, my next birthday in three weeks, 
I'm going to be 69 years old, so I'm not going to be an Olympic gymnast. I have that limitation. Shucks. But you know what? I am unfettered to go out into the world and do precisely what I came here to do. So when we think about being tied to things, what do we need to get rid of? I think it is something called a tutu. So, ladies, who was a little ballerina girl? Who went through Miss Maisie's ballet studio? Quite a few of us. And you know what? We used to wear those little pink net tutus. And did we look cute? Woohoo! When we were three, when we were seven. Oh, we look so cute in our little tutus. But if we came to church today wearing tutus, that would be a wardrobe malfunction of the quintessential degree. But do you know what tutu we really need to get rid of? It's that one where we go, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too uneducated, I'm too poor, I'm too set in my ways. No, you're not because you are created in the image and likeness of God. And God is not to anything except magnificent. We can do that. I am too magnificent not to step forward with great courage and great faith to do precisely what I came here to do. What did Jesus tell us? Greater things than I have done, that can they also do, because I go unto my Father. Now that, my friends, is not some idle gibberish. That's a promise. And it is not a politician promise. It is a God promise. What have we been told? We're supposed to go out and do miraculous things. So let's do that. Thank you, Jesus, for those words. Thank you, God, for this day. And thank you, Unity of Dallas, for allowing me to come here and share in your great love and your great spirit. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Let's go into the silence. Let's close our eyes. Let's feel the floor beneath our feet, the chairs beneath our seats, and know that we're in the presence of all love, all light, and all power. Let's go into the silence with these words that I happened to pick up this morning on the table from some enlightened soul here at Unity of Dallas. Dear one, you are a beloved child of the living God, and your divine nature is one of perfection. You are blessed with innate strength, wisdom, love, and energy. I see you as God sees you, in a vision of spiritual perfection and absolute good. For healing, I affirm wholeness. For prosperity, I affirm abundance. For harmony, I affirm understanding. For peace, I affirm love. For guidance, I behold the clarity of God's light within you. In faith and with gratitude, we pray. We give thanks for answered prayer. And we trust God for the perfect outcome. Let us take these words into the silence, into that place where God can talk to you with inspiration.
in faith and with gratitude we pray. We give thanks for answered prayer and we trust God for the perfect outcome. And so it is, and so we let it be. Thank you, God. Amen. Back into this room and this lovely life and this lovely day. God bless you all.